today we're going to talk about the Torah, which is a very good place to start. Actually, I'll be starting a series on the Torah, which is the very uh, basic, fundamental beginning of our faith, the foundation of our faith. Everything else is built upon the Torah. So that's the starting place. In fact, people talk about getting back to the New Testament church, but what are two things the New Testament church didn't have? A New Testament and a church. They didn't have a New Testament, they didn't have a church. They were meeting in homes and synagogues, and the New Testament hadn't been written yet. They were in the process of writing, so they didn't have it yet. So uh, when Paul in Acts chapter 17 was teaching the Bereans, let's see what happened. In Acts chapter 17, uh, verse 11, but we're actually, yeah, verse 11. We'll actually uh, get some context here. Let's move up to verse 10. And the brothers immediately in the same night, Paul and Silas, in the city of Berea, and when they had come there, they entered the Jewish church. No? Synagogue. Amen. For those Jews who were there were more noble than those Jews who were in Thessalonica. Let's find out why they were so noble. And they gladly heard the word from them every day while discerning from what? The scriptures, whether these things were so. What scriptures were they looking in? Were they looking in their Gideon New Testaments? No. No? In Acts chapter 2, when, the, when uh, the Acts chapter 2 event happened, they were just handing out Gideon New Testaments? So what scriptures could they possibly have been looking in to see if what Paul said was so? The Tanakh, the Torah, and the prophets and the writings. And Paul said, what are you looking at old wineskins for new wine for? Wait till I write the book of Ephesians. You'll find it all on there. No. <laughs> Paul said they were more noble than the others he had taught because they didn't believe him unless it agreed with the scriptures. They were checking him against the scriptures, against the Tanakh, to see if what Paul said agreed with the Tanakh. And if what Paul said didn't agree with the Tanakh, what would Paul have us do? If we understand this passage as a plain, simple meaning, what would Paul have us do if what he said didn't agree with the Tanakh? Would he have us believe it? No. If what Paul said didn't agree with the Tanakh, then we were supposed to reject it. He didn't want us to believe him if it didn't agree with the Tanakh. Amen. <clears throat> okay? 2 Timothy 3.16. 2 Timothy and abstain that's 2 316 every writing which was written by the spirit now the Greek the Greek says all scripture which is a little misleading because then you could say whatever somebody called scripture was valid but the Aramaic is actually much more specific the Aramaic says every writing or every scripture which was written by the Ruach is profitable for teaching, for reproof, and for correction, and for instruction in that which is righteousness. Right? Now, what scriptures is he talking about? Is he talking about the New Testament? No. You know, they're actually trying to take the Tanakh out of your Bible, if you will. Let me explain what I mean. If you go down to the local Christian bookstore and you ask to see the Bibles, they'll show you the shelves of Bibles and whatnot, then you say, well, can you show me the New Testaments? 
and they'll show you shelves of New Testaments. And say, okay, I, I get it, that's volume two. Where's the companion volume? Where do you have your Old Testaments published all standalone? No. See, what they're trying to do is actually take the Old Testament out of the Bible. The uh, uh, Church of Christ Campbellite actually has a, a catchphrase that they use. The Old Testament, the New Testament is for her teaching. The Old Test for the New Testament for her doctrine, but the Old Testament for her history only. In other words, the Old Testament is of value only for historical and background information, not to, uh, for any foundation of doctrine, they would say. It's interesting, this is actually the second time this has happened. It happened once before. You see, there's actually a whole group of books that were taken out of your Bible once before. Yes. Called the Apocrypha. And they took those books, and at first, they didn't dare actually take the books out of the Bible. So what they did was they took those books and they moved them to the back and they put them in an appendix labeled Apocrypha in the back of the book. But even then, they didn't dare actually take those books out. And people talk about uh, this, you know, the, if you do, in fact, you'll buy Bibles, they'll say, authorized, 1611 edition. It's a lie almost all the time. The 1611 King James Version had the Apocrypha in an appendix in the back of the book. Now, after the Apocrypha was published, after the, the King James Ver Version was first published in 1611, with the Apocrypha in it, publishers started deciding uh, that there was a demand for, you know, that the printing press was going and the technology was going really good for a smaller, cheaper, easier to publish Bibles. So it was easier and cheaper to publish Bibles without the Apocrypha in them. So they took them out. They started publishing Bibles that didn't contain them. It was no small deal because an edict came down because the King James Version in England was the King's edition. It was, you know, by edict of the King. And when publishers took it upon themselves to mess with it and start taking parts out, a decree was issued threatening to arrest any publisher and put them in prison that published the King James Version without the Apocrypha in it. And yet they continued, and eventually the almighty dollar won. And today, it is very difficult to find the King James Version of the Bible that has the Apocrypha in it. <clears throat> and so now they're trying to take the New Testament out as well. So that's how the, the typically 2 uh, Timothy 3.16 is understood, for example, especially by the Church of Christ Campbellite. Um, but uh, that's just one group. Lots of them, the majority of Christianity, understands this passage in that way. But if we look up just a little bit, it says in verse 15, and that from your youth, talking to Timothy, you were taught the set apart or sacred writings which are able to make you wise to life by the faith of Yeshua the Messiah. What, if we had any doubt before, what scriptures would Timothy have been studying in his youth? The Tanakh. Well, that means that 2 Timothy 3.16 is telling us that the Tanakh is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in that which is righteousness. Okay? That means that we are authorized by Scripture to take the following approach. If you understand something in the New Testament, or so-called New Testament, in such a way that it conflicts with the Tanakh, you're, you're not understanding it properly. And we must constantly be asking ourselves, can you get here 
from there while we're trying to understand what the so-called New Testament is teaching. Because if you can't get here from there, you're not understanding it properly. There being the Tanakh. <clears throat> okay. So, if that is the case, if it was true that the Torah was to be done away with, that someday it would come about that we shouldn't observe the Torah, you'd think that that would be somewhere in the Tanakh. It would foretell us that. Yes. Right? On the other hand, Elohim, all knowing, foreseeing all possible, the future and all possible avenues of what man could come up with, every false doctrine we could ever come up with, he could foresee. If he wanted to warn us that that false doctrine would arise and would not be true, what sort of things do we think that the Tanakh might say? What would the Tanakh say? You might, you might, what, what might the Tanakh say to tell us that that's not true? Beware of false prophets. Beware of false prophets. Well, yeah, we're going to get into a definition of a false prophet here in a minute. But what about it say about the Torah itself? That the Torah is? Eternal. I'm sorry? Eternal. Eternal. Perpetual. Forever. Huh? Perpetual. Perpetual. Non-changing. Okay. Non-changing. Non-changing. Exactly. Okay, and in fact, it does say that. In the Torah itself. Repeatedly. Um, in fact, I used to have a college teacher that said, if I say something twice, pay attention. It might be on the test later. This is more than twice. For example, Exodus 27, 21, it shall be a statute forever to their generations. Exodus 28, 43, it shall be a statute forever to him and his seed after him. I always say forever means forever, and that's all forever ever means. But, believe it or not, there are some dispensationalists and such who try and redefine forever. And so they say that the word forever in Hebrew is along, which can also mean age. So, well, it really just means for that age. Elohim, in his infinite wisdom and infinite understanding and knowledge and foreseeing this, Clarified forever, lest we misunderstand. Repeatedly using phrases like, for all of your generations forever. Are we still here? Then it's still forever. Exodus 29, 28, a statute forever. Exodus 30, 21, it shall be a statute forever to them to him and to his seed throughout their generations. Exodus 31, 17. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. I won't read all of them, but just to give you an idea, Leviticus chapter 6, verse 18 and verse 22. And chapter 7, verse 34. And verse 36. And Leviticus chapter 10, yes, verse 9. <coughs> and verse 15. Yes, sir. And Leviticus chapter 17, verse 7. And Leviticus chapter 23, verse 14. And verse 21. And verse 41. And Leviticus chapter 24, verse 3. And Numbers, chapter 10, verse 8. And chapter 15, verse 15. And chapter 18, verse 8. Oh, and verse 11. And verse 19. And verse 23. And Numbers, chapter 19, verse 10. Not to mention Deuteronomy, chapter 5, verse 29. You get the idea. How often 
the Torah emphasizes to us that it is for all of our generations forever. And for those who want to play the ceremonial law versus the moral law and all that sort of nonsense, by the way, the terms ceremonial law and moral law do not appear in the Torah or in the Tanakh or in the New Testament. They've been invented by men. But many of those instances that I just cited where it talks about the statutes being forever and for all generations were specifically attached to commandments that were part of what they would certainly call the ceremonial law. The psalmist puts it well in Psalm 119, verse 160. Your word is truth oh, yes. from the beginning. Oh, yes. And every one of your righteous judgments endures forever. Yeah. Yes, sir. Changing the Torah was brought up. The Torah does not change. Because the Torah prohibits us from adding to the Torah yes. and taking from the Torah. Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 2. You shall not add to the word which I command you, neither shall you diminish a thing from it, that you may keep the commandments. Amen. And Deuteronomy chapter 12 verse 32. Whatever thing I command you, observe to do, you shall not add thereto, nor diminish from it. And we're going to come back to that passage in a minute, in a few minutes here, because that is the key to one kind of false prophet. Not every false prophet is somebody that foretells things that doesn't happen. That's only one kind of false prophet. Yes, that's There's another kind of false prophet. Yes, sir. That uh, is talked about in Deuteronomy chapters, uh, uh, chapter 13. The Messiah was also very clear on this issue. Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 19. Do not think that I have come to destroy the Torah or the prophets. I have not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Fulfill doesn't mean do away with, by the way. If I fill up my gas tank, do I throw it away? No. no. For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one yud, which is the smallest Hebrew letter, or one mark will by no means pass from the Torah till all is fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so, he will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. And he who does and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Yeshua is actually referring here to a midrash. The yud, as I mentioned, is the smallest Hebrew letter. Yeshua says not one yud would fall from the Torah or pass from the Torah. Till heaven and earth be fulfilled. He's actually, uh, till all things be fulfilled. He's actually citing a, a Midrash. You see, according to Deuteronomy chapter 17, whenever a king, was in, uh, a new king was initiated into office, he, had, he was required to write out a copy of the entire Torah for himself, a process that took about a year. Okay? So he had to write a copy of the Torah. This was to make sure that he knew the Torah inside out. He actually couldn't, he wasn't ignorant of any commandment because he actually had written down the entire Torah. <clears throat> so as the Mirosh goes, when King Solomon was copying Deuteronomy chapter 17, actually, uh, chapter 17, verse 17, where it says that the king shall not multiply wives to himself. Well, what did Solomon do? Well, we know that, you know, if 900 plus isn't uh, multiplying, then <laughs> of course, what did he do when he got to the passage? Well, teach a short little piece of Hebrew grammar here. The yud, that little tiny little letter on the front of a verb in Hebrew, normally indicates what we call the imperfect form of the verb. The imperfect form of the verb means it's ongoing action or it's action that hasn't happened yet. It's not complete. Okay? Similar but not identical to future tense. Okay? But 
without the yod, the verb is in what's called the perfect form, which, okay? So when he got to the verb for multiplied to himself, he removed the yod. He didn't copy the yod. It's just a tiny little letter. Maybe he missed it. Maybe he accidentally on purpose missed it. But he took the yod out. And in taking the yod out, he transformed the verse from saying that the king shall not, the ongoing form, the king shall not take or multiply many wives to himself. Instead, it's his copy said, the king does not multiply wives to himself. So on the one hand, the original meaning of the text was that the king shouldn't do that. But Solomon's copy said, the king does not do that. <laughs> so on the one hand, it's saying, don't take too many wives to yourself. Don't take on multiple wives. But on the other hand, it says, it doesn't matter how many wives you take on, Solomon, you haven't multiplied them. No, no amount is too many. Because no amount, however many wives you take, the king hasn't multiplied wives to himself. <sighs> just by taking the one little letter out. So as the Midrash goes, the letter Yud that was removed ascended to Elohim and petitioned Elohim and said, you cannot allow this to happen. If one Yud could be taken from the Torah, its entire meaning can transform. Anyone can make it say anything. Yes. You have to protect the integrity of the text. And so Elohim took action. We don't know exactly how this transpired in the literal, physical sense, but the Yud was restored to the Torah, and Elohim declared that not one Yud nor one mark would pass from the Torah till all things be fulfilled. Yes. And this is what Yeshua is referring to. We often try to rationalize and try and transform the text. You see, the Torah was intended to transform man. The intention is for the wisdom of the Torah to gestate in our understanding, give birth to a knowledge of the Torah within us, and make us more like the Torah so that we can form. We want then, because the Torah becomes a way of our thinking, we want to be told. It's programmed into us. But, so often people try and do the other way around. Instead of the Torah transforming the person and the scripture transforming the person, the person transforms the scripture. Yes. That's good. Yes. I knew a man once who uh, fell into the same error of Solomon and decided that he was going to uh, take on multiple wives. And he was so well, you can't do that. Right off the bat, says in the scripture, an elder must be the husband of one wife. So he transforms the text and says that it says that an elder must be one with his wife. I've also heard them say that an elder must be the husband of his first wife. Neither are possible renderings of the passage and involve adding words to the text. There is no word with and there is no it word for his in the text. It does not say that. It says an elder will be the husband of one wife. Period. Exclamation point. And it's actually derived from the very same commandment in the Torah, in Deuteronomy 17, 17, just generalizing it to all leaders. Yes. And by the way, Paul also <coughs> told us that what is the assembly supposed to do? The assembly is supposed to emulate the behavior of the leaders. So it's really for everybody. Okay. Paul also tells us, believe it or not, those that think Paul is the, the uh, Torah destroyer, he's not. Uh, as you all know, those who have been going through the, he the uh, Romans class with us, and which will be continuing today after after the cover dictionary. Um, 
Paul did not teach against Torah. Paul says in Romans 3.31, do we then abolish the Torah through faith? Absolutely not. We uphold the Torah. King David was saved by faith alone, according to Romans. But we're also told that he, in Psalm 119, verses 97, 113, and 163, that he delighted in the Torah. He actually wrote Psalm 119. Psalm 119 is the longest psalm in the Bible. It's the longest chapter of the Bible. And Psalms is the only book of the Bible that was actually divided into chapters by, originally, by, if you will, by all of you. So the rest of it, the chapters and verses that you have in your Bible, that was all done by monks, monkeying with the text. Now, sometimes it's handy, but it can also create some problems, as we'll talk about later. There's nothing wrong with the Torah. Therefore, there's no reason that Elohim would come along and say, ah, oh, I made a mistake. What was I thinking? <laughs> and by the way, if Elohim wanted a people for himself that didn't teach the Torah, i.e. the Christian church, why would he need to create the Christian church? He already had a people that weren't keeping the Torah. He didn't seem to like it very much. <laughs> In Galatians chapter 6, verse 2, in fact, the Torah is called the Torah of the Mashiach. Now, there is a doctrine, which I'm sure you've never heard, <laughs> that Elohim just gave the Torah to us to prove we couldn't do it. <laughs> Quoting from a book, God's Plan of the Ages, by Lewis Talbot. This is a, well, probably hasn't been in a while because things have evolved and more books have been written, but this used to be this used as a textbook in seminaries across the country. <clears throat> Said, Israel, in blindness and pride and self-righteousness, presumed to ask for the law, and God granted their request to show them that they could not keep his law. Now let's, let's think this through logically. Okay? Elohim gives man the Torah. Okay? As we'll find in a minute, he actually specifically tells us we can keep it. And then he says, if you don't keep it, I am going to punish you for not keeping it. In fact, long list of curses for not keeping it. And man doesn't keep the Torah. So he comes along in Jeremiah chapter 11 and he says, last chance, I am going to punish you for not keeping this Torah. And Israel still doesn't keep the Torah. And Elohim brings down massive curses in the book of Jeremiah and the book of Lamentations upon, Torah, upon Israel for not keeping the Torah. And then Elohim says, now, I've done this to prove that you can't keep the Torah. Let me give an allegory. A parent says to their little four-year-old child, flap your wings and fly to the moon. <coughs> the child says, I can't. The parent says, I tell you, you can do it. Flap your wings and fly to the moon. In fact, if you don't flap your wings and fly to the moon, I am going to spank you. <laughs> So the child is sitting here flapping and flapping. Uh, no progress. So the father grabs the child and spanks the child, whoops the tar out of that child, sets the child back down. The child's looking up at the, the father through stars <laughs> circling his head. And then the father says, now we just went through this little exercise so I could teach you that you can't flap your wings and fly to the thing. What kind of God would that be? What kind of father would that be? What kind of Yahweh would that be? That is not our Elohim. But that's a sin, but that's what they, they are saying their Elohim is. Their Elohim would do that. 
Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 11 through 14. Very clear. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 11. For this commandment which I command you this day is not too hard for you. Amen. Neither is it far off. It is not in heaven that you should say, Who shall go up for us to heaven and bring it to us and make us to hear it that we may do it? Neither is it beyond the sea that you should say, Who shall go over the sea for us and bring it to us and make us to hear it that we may do it? But the word is very near to you in your mouth and in your heart that you may do it. By the way, this is quoted in Romans chapter 10, and when we get into our Romans study today, we'll go into detail about some really special things about this passage. <clears throat> we have confirmation that the Torah can be kept in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, we are told that Yeshua, the Messiah, was tempted in all things just as we are. So, was it possible for the Messiah to keep the Torah? Yes. Hello? Did the Messiah keep the Torah? Amen. Did he ever violate the Torah? Amen. No. So it must have been possible, right? Yes. Well, was it a fair test? Yes. I mean, can't we then just say, well, that was easy for you. It was possible for you. It's not possible for me. <laughs> right? Only Hebrews 4.15 tells us that he was tempted in all things just like me. Right. So all the things that make me not want to keep Torah, he had to resist too. Amen. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so there's, if it was a fair test, then it has to be possible to keep the Torah. Now, that does not mean that anybody has, besides the Messiah, kept the Torah without falter. No one has. That's another issue. Okay? But don't confuse the two, because the fact that the Messiah was able not to sin does not mean that he was not able to sin. <laughs> because if he was not able to sin, then it was a cakewalk. <laughs> it was a cakewalk. It wasn't a cakewalk. If you read... The Garden of Gethsemane experience alone, you know, it was no cakewalk. Okay. Paul was very misunderstood. We could do whole teachings about Paul being misunderstood. Um, <clears throat> there are those who actually believe that the Torah wasn't abolished by Yeshua. We call these hyper-dispensationalists. The Torah wasn't abolished by Yeshua, it was abolished by Paul. Okay? Um, one of these was a guy named uh, Maurice Johnson, a uh, dispensationalist writer. He wrote, apparently God allowed this system of Jewish ordinances to be practiced about 30 years after Christ fulfilled it, because in his patience, God only gradually showed the Jews how it was that his program was changing. Thus it was that after God had slowly led the Christians out of the Jewish religion, that Paul finally wrote these glorious, liberating truths. In other words, Jesus didn't do away with the law. Paul did. Yeah. And we're going to get to some of the significance of that in a minute. But Paul did not do away with the Torah. He couldn't if he wanted to. 2 Peter 3, 15 through 16 warns us, it says, in which, talking about Paul's writings, Kepha writes, in which are some things hard to understand, which those who are untaught and unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do also the rest of the scriptures. Paul himself knew that he was being misunderstood in this way, as we covered in previously in the Romans class, Romans 3, 8. And why not say, let us do evil that good may come, as we are slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, Romans 3, 8. As well, the problems with Lashon Hara and slander, it gets around and it stays around. That lie about Paul is still being told after nearly 2,000 years. Romans 6, 1 through 2. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. In verse 15, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under the Torah but under grace? Certainly not. In fact, 
Paul was misunderstood in this manner in Acts chapter 21. He comes to Jerusalem, and a group of the Jewish people come to him and say, Hey, we've heard that you're running around teaching people in the Gentile world that they don't need to keep the Torah. And so we have, but we don't know, we know that's not true. So we want to set the story straight. So we have these guys here who are taking the Nazarite vow. We want you to go take the vow with them and make the offerings. That doesn't mean they pass the pledge. It means, in keeping with Numbers chapter 6, they fired up the altar and they, they killed some animals. After Yeshua died, after the crucifixion, they were sacrificing animals in the temple? Yes. Yes, Paul was doing just that. So, uh, Paul did many such things. He circumcised Timothy in Acts chapter 16, verses 1 through 3. And what if one shall say, ah, but he didn't sacrifice, hey, sorry, he didn't sacrifice it. He didn't circumcise uh, Titus in Galatians. Galatians doesn't say that Titus wasn't circumcised. Titus says that, that Titus was not compelled to be circumcised. Compelled means forced. If you read the book of the Maccabees, you'll find out what forced circumcision was. Okay? All Galatians tells us is that Titus wasn't forced to be circumcised. Not that he wasn't circumcised. Yeah. It just means that he was circumcised voluntarily. Uh, Acts chapter 18, verse 18, he took the Nazarite vow, and he does it again in Acts chapter 21. He taught and observed Passover in Acts 26, 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and chapter 11. He taught and observed Shavuot in Acts 20, 16, and 1 Corinthians 16, 8. He taught and observed fasting for Yom Kippur in Acts 27, 9. And he even performed animal sacrifices in the temple in Acts 21, verse 17 to 26, and Acts chapter 24, verses 17 through 18. <coughs> Here are some things that Paul said. Acts 25, 8. Neither against the Jewish Torah nor against the temple nor against Caesar have I offended in anything at all. Acts 28, 17. I have done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers. Romans 7, 12. The Torah is holy and the commandment is holy, just, and good. In Romans 3.31, do we nullify the Torah through faith? May it never be. On the contrary, we maintain the Torah. So these Christians must think uh, 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 that uh, Paul was a liar. Right? Well, believe it or not. <clears throat> Anybody have a Ryrie study Bible on them? They're very common. Yeah? If you look at a Ryrie study Bible... There's a footnote to Acts chapter 21, verse 24 in the, in the Ryrie study Bible. The footnote says that uh, um, calls Paul for actually performing these animal sacrifices in the temple in Acts chapter 21, quote, that they proved that he was, quote, after all, only a middle-of-the-road Christian. One dispensationalist, a guy named M.A. DeHaan, wrote an entire book called The Five Blunders of Paul. In The Five Blunders of Paul, he lists five things. He goes over five things that Paul did that he shouldn't have done that went against Paul's, supposedly, his own teaching. Okay, so let's try to wrap your brain around this, okay? Dispensationalists, especially the ultra-dispensationalists, make Paul the father of their doctrine, and then condemn Paul for not teaching his own doctrine. <laughs> How do you do that? How do you do that? Where's the intellectual honesty here? I said we'd come back to uh, Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 32. And let's, let's go to Deuteronomy 12.32. Or Deuteronomy 13.1. Depending on whether you have a Jewish or a Christian version. <clears throat> Deuteronomy 
because it really should be. Remember I said that the chapters were added, the chapter divisions and the verse divisions were added by monks monkeying with the text. Okay? Because it was, a, it was this monk that was on a pilgrimage that divided them into chapter and verses. And the way he did it was that whenever his donkey's foot would clump, he would start a new verse. And whenever it swished its tail, he'd start a new chapter. Uh, that's a joke, but it's actually more devious than that because there are chapter divisions in the middle of sentences, in the middle of paragraphs, in the middle of thoughts, and this one is strategically placed. This one is strategically placed and actually different from the chapter division in the Hebrew. They have tried to separate chapter 12, verse 32 from chapter 13. In the original Hebrew, it is actually the beginning of the chapter. So that when it says, all this word which I command you, that you should observe to do it, you shall not add there to, to nor diminish from it. It doesn't stop there, it's actually introducing the thought. As it continues, if there arise in the midst of you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and he give you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or wonder comes to pass, whereof he spoke unto you, saying, Let us go after other gods which you have not known, and let us serve them. You shall not hearken unto the words of that prophet, or unto that dreamer of dreams. For Yahweh your Elohim puts you to proof, to know whether you love Yahweh your Elohim with all your heart and with all your soul. The next verse is key. After Yahweh your Elohim shall you walk, and him shall you fear, and his commandments shall you keep. And unto his voice shall you hearken, and him shall you serve, and unto him shall you cleave. And if that prophet or dreamer of dreams shall be, that, and that prophet or dreamer of dreams shall be put to death, because he has spoken perversion against Yahweh your Elohim, who brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you out of the house of bondage, to draw you aside out of the way which Yahweh your Elohim commanded you to walk in. So you shall put away evil from the midst of you. Now, people, when you talk about false prophets, they know about Deuteronomy chapter 18, where it talks about a prophet that tells things that doesn't happen. But Deuteronomy chapter 13 tells us about a different kind of prophet. This prophet may in fact have a 100% success rate in predicting the future. He may perform signs, wonders, and miracles, and amazing healings. In fact, he will. If you read about the beast in Revelation chapter 13, he's going to have an amazing ministry of miracles. <clears throat> but if he says, you don't have to keep this Torah, it doesn't matter. He is a false prophet, and we're required not to listen to a thing he has to say. That's good. Okay? <clears throat> now, Deuteronomy, remember we talked about the foundation? You can kind of think about the, the word, if you will, like a pyramid with a base on the bottom. The Torah is the base. Everything is built upon it. Then you have the prophets. The prophets came to admonish us for not keeping the Torah, but they presume that the Torah is true. So we start with the beginning. We accept the Torah as their foundation. Then we come to the prophets and the writings and then the new scriptures, the uh, the, the writings of, of the Nazarenes, I call it, the Ketubim Nazarene. Okay, each one is built upon the foundation of the next. If you were to find, for example, may it never be, it would never happen, I'm not saying it would, I'm just saying hypothetically, that Moses was a false prophet. Okay. Then that would mean Isaiah was a false prophet and all the others were false prophets because they presupposed Moses is true. Yeah. Okay. However, if you were to find, and you never would, but if you were to find that Isaiah was a false prophet, it would not impact Moses. You see, see what I mean about the foundation, building upon the foundation. And so, Deuteronomy 13 starting with chapter 12, verse 32, because that's really 
is a very important passage to remember forever because it settles the argument. Mm -hmm. it settles the argument forever. If Paul came along teaching that you didn't have to keep and observe the Torah, what does Deuteronomy chapter 13 tell us that we would do with Paul? Yeah. Hello? Mm -hmm. Rejected? Yeah. Not listened to him. <laughs> False prophet. Yeah. Right? And if Yeshua came along and taught that the Torah didn't need to be kept or abolished the Torah, what would that tell us about Yeshua? Yeah. This is why, by the way, that rabbinic Judaism and Orthodox Judaism has rejected Jesus. Not the really Yeshua, most of them aren't familiar with him. But the Jesus that they have been presented with that came to abolish the law, they have rejected because Deuteronomy 13 told them to. They did what they were supposed to do. That Jesus, that Torah that came to free you from the bondage of the law is a false prophet. The real Yeshua isn't. So, even if in debating with people that are, uh, that are supporting traditional Christian theology, if you will, uh, that, that, that Paul is opposed to the Torah and, and teaching us not to keep Torah, even if they're right, they're wrong. Because if they're right, then Paul is a false prophet. And we would, they all, they're not proving that the Torah shouldn't be kept. They're only proving that Paul should be rejected. If they prove the same thing about Yeshua, they're not proving that Yeshua, that the Torah had been re, uh, done away with. They're only proving that Yeshua wasn't the Messiah. You see what I'm saying? Because that's the foundation. Deuteronomy 13 came first. But if we're right, and they're misunderstanding Paul, and they're misunderstanding Yeshua, and they're misunderstanding the New Testament, then Paul is still a pro prophet, an emissary, and whatnot. Yeshua is still the Messiah. And it all holds together. So we're arguing for the integrity of the scripture, and they're effectively arguing against it. And all you have to do is just keep going back to Deuteronomy 13 over and over and over again. Because the point is, you put them in the position of arguing that Paul's a false prophet. They're not arguing that the law isn't to be done away with. They're arguing that Paul's a false prophet. That's simple. Okay? Because the Torah is for all generations forever. Okay? That's all I have for today. For, not for today. For the Bema teaching. So, uh,